Hey, I'm Caleb Dennison, AV editor at Digital Trends, and I am pleased to have Andrew Jones, one of the world's great speaker designers and engineers here with us. Come on, you know it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to admire what seems to be one of the cornerstones of your design and engineering philosophy, and that is um, you take measurements very seriously as part of the, the process, um, and, and not just measurements in general, but the right kind of measurements, if I understand right. But you also um, fold in a lot of listening as part of the process and describe the two as being intertwined. Um, is that right? I mean, uh, how, did, how did you come to embrace that particular approach? I mean, has it always been that way for you, or did you learn along the way? I would say that with being at KEF, which was very technically based, they were more towards the technical and measurement side of the design process than the old style of tweaking with the crossovers and components all over the floor and switching mm -hmm. them in and out while they listen. And you could say both have got some validity, except that you need to know what you're doing. And unless you've got a methodical design approach, you're going to take too long to do things. So if you can tie in measurements to sound, and it, with a speaker, we, it's fairly known mostly what the goals are for the technical aspects. So we design towards a measurement capability, then listen to it. But if it doesn't sound right, we then have to question why doesn't it sound right? Is it that the source material, which is critical to making these judgments, isn't showing up in the right light? Mm -hmm. Did we get over enthusiastic in that the target we set for our, for our measurement, for example, we thought we'd actually achieved it. We listen, oh, it's not quite right. Mm -hmm. We go back and look at the measurements, and nearly always you find, ah, you know, it wasn't quite as good as it should have been. Mm -hmm. There's no point trying to judge against a criteria if you haven't adequately met that criteria. Mm -hmm. You don't learn that way. So I'll always go back, look at the measurements, based on what I heard, identify is it something I heard that's not revealed in the measurements, or was it actually there all along? Mm. And then I'll make an adjustment, see what it does to that measurement, then go back and listen. So I want to always complete that circle, and that way I'll learn for next time. So for someone who's looking to purchasing a new speaker system, or audio system in general, in today's landscape, how would you suggest they go about doing that? You know, I know that's a huge question, <laughs> you know, but these days, where do you start and what do you keep in mind when you're out to go buy a nice, a nice audio system, you know, or just to go audition speakers? You know, what, what do you want to keep in mind? Well, of course, these days it's much easier to find out what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. So you've got professionals like yourself giving uh, readers opinions of, because you've had the chance to listen to it. Mm -hmm. There's shows, there's, you know, shows have come back and there's more of them than there were in recent times. So that's a good source to go around, mm -hmm. although it, it can be, ex I find extremely disappointing, some of the sounds I hear at shows mm -hmm. from people who ought to know better. Mm -hmm. Then there's dealers, and then there's recommendations on the internet. Now, of course, anyone can give an opinion. I guess if enough people are giving common opinion, then that's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. um, Dealers should be a good starting point because they can guide you, they can loan you stuff if you're a good customer. Mm -hmm. um, but at least in this country, you've got so many options of buying and then returning if you don't like it. Right. And coming from England, that never happens. Right. <laughs> it was always, really? I can do that? <laughs> um, do you think that's a good idea, the in-home audition? I, I think it's, you have to listen in-home. Right. Because you're never going to, even a good dealer doesn't have the variety of equipment that you may want to audition. And there's a limit to how much time at the low end you can spend hooking up a variety of different things to give you a listen to exactly what you want. So, and of course the home environment will sound different than um, the store environment. Right. So I think that is critical. So the, if you have the opportunity to try before you've finally commit to buy, that is great. It should be yeah. done. 
Um, you know, along those lines, uh, we know that, as you just said, the room that you put the speakers in is going to have a dramatic effect on how those speakers will sound. In yeah. fact, some say that you're often listening to the room more than the speakers or hearing more of the room's effects than, than what the speakers are putting out. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. If you could make only one suggestion, you know, the most effective acoustic treatment that you could do to a room, um, what would it be? Well, first of all, yes, please do something to the room. You're absolutely right there. It is a critical aspect. Don't waste time on other tweaks until you've at least tweaked the room. That will make right. the most dramatic difference. So it's both positioning of the speakers, positioning of yourself. Mm -hmm. So even if you can't treat the room, try and get a location that works. So that's going to take a lot of time. Mm. Small movements can make quite dramatic differences. And I say it's both where the speakers are and where you choose to listen. So ideally, I'd like to say you should allow total freedom and move. I, when I do a show, I have you know, typically two days, mm -hmm. but I will spend a day and a half moving things around the room, all the equipment, all the speakers, until I find the right location. So if you can do that at home, great, mm -hmm. do it. If you don't have quite that amount of freedom, do the best that you can with positioning and then look to see what you can do with room treatments. And that can get difficult. You know, room treatments look like room treatments. Yeah. And most people, the other half doesn't want that right. in the home. So are there, product, are there things that you could use that aren't purpose-built room treatments, like books on a bookshelf, absolutely. plants, so, that kind of thing? Plants, not so not much. Not so much with the plant? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but certainly, bookshelves. Pictures hanging at an angle, mm -hmm. uh, you know, larger objects, um, not just bookcases, but display cabinets. Anything you can put in there to break up large, flat, flat surfaces. surfaces. Yeah. And it's not necessarily about absorbing the sound. It's, you can have, you, you need uniformity uh, throughout the spectrum. So either reasonably uniformly reflective or reasonably uniformly absorptive. If you've got absorption that only works in some frequency ranges, like the thin panels only absorb the high frequencies, mm -hmm. so they leave the mid-range still bouncing around, mm -hmm. and certainly the bass. Uh, bass is always going to be the most difficult, so if you've got concrete walls, concrete floor, concrete ceiling, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in a bunker, right. good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just a variety of surfaces to break up the sound. So my goal is both to try and optimize rooms if I'm setting a system up in there, but from a design point of view, I need to be sensitive to what kind of environments are people using. And that can even change from country to country. Like the northern European countries tend to have more solidly built homes, more sparse, so they are more reverberant. They, they can often be a nice reverberant character. You know, I, first thing I do in a, when I walk in a room, I start listening to people and going, ooh, this sounds comfortable. Oh no, this sounds loud, it would drive me crazy. Mm. So um, some homes are different like that. So sometimes the character of speakers produced in other countries reflect the environments they're going to go into. And so one of my goals with designing speakers is, how can I design it that it will be least sensitive to different room characteristics? Mm -hmm. uh, hence, whenever I kind of design these concentric drivers, mm -hmm. because they are more forgiving of different room characteristics. But yes, fix the room first. What do you think the hi-fi audio industry, the people who are making these products um, for other people to purchase and enjoy, what do you think they should be paying attention to that they aren't. You know, what's, what's, what do we need going forward in the future to help attract younger listeners to, oh, to this passion and the hobby that you, know, you and I share? What, what do you think it, it's going to take? I think what we miss as an industry is how to engage new audiences. You know, we're all getting older and grayer. We're playing the music, and certainly I play the music that wouldn't be, <laughs> youngsters wouldn't be caught right. dead listening to, maybe. And I'm trying to change that. 
and trying to understand music on the go, how do we get people to concentrate more? But we need to understand why they listen the way they do and not ignore it, but try and steer them to something better, which means getting into their world first so they recognize you, that you are trying to meet their needs and then steer them. You can't just say, you're doing it wrong, do it this way. Mm. And I think certainly the industry is getting more involved in personal audio now. They've had to because <laughs> not enough people are in the current market. Right. And now let's get more into that and understand how people listen, when they listen, what music they listen to, and then play that to them in, in a better way. Uh, it's, it's always about demonstration. If people don't know what's possible, they're not going to uh, get involved. So uh, we need to involve ourselves in their world, go to the events that they're going to, find the music that they're listening to, and say, what will make them listen to the music more enthusiastically? And if we can understand that, we should be able to get them on board. Mm. Great answer. <laughs> um, well, that's it. Thank you so much. Um, well, that's it for now. We're going to adjourn to another room uh, where we have a full Pioneer Elite by Andrew Jones speaker system with Atmos functionality set up. We're going to talk about speaker positioning and, um, and how to properly set up a system and calibrate a receiver. It's going to be a lot of fun, so come back and uh, check that out soon. <laughs>